question. Sorry. My question is to Sashi Tharoor. Happy Olam first. Oh, thank you. Um, you too. You, you, you mentioned about Britain, uh, mentioned that Britain left India in, uh, in a worse off condition than, than it had it been without Britain. You also mentioned about reparation from Britain. What about the skills in engineering and manufacturing India acquired, the administrative and democratic processes it inherited, the infrastructure left behind, and most of all, the rapid education of the Indian people, of which you are an excellent e example? <laughs> Surely, no one can price these intangible values that were gained during the British rule in India and propel the country to its present position as one of the leading countries in the world. Finally, one more question. <laughs> I'm doing a Jeffrey Robertson here. In your opinion, where would India be today if the British did not step into India? Oh, there's a lot, lot there. It'll take the rest of the program to answer. I'll try and touch on it. <laughs> but this is almost like uh, the American saying to the widow of the American president, apart from that, Mrs. Lincoln, how did you enjoy the play? <laughs> I mean, you know, really, the British came to one of the richest countries in the world, uh, accounting for 27% of global GDP in 1700, 23% uh, in 1800, and over 200 years of exploitation, depredation, loot, and destruction, reduced it to a poster child for third world poverty, uh, just over 3% of global GDP, 90% of the population living below the poverty line when the British left in 1947, a literacy rate, you speak of education, a literacy rate below 17%, and a life expectancy of 27. The growth rate of British India from 1900 to 1947 was 0.001%. That's what they were doing while draining the country of taxes and resources. Education, my gosh, the British, the last thing they wanted to do was invest in educating Indians. Uh, it, Will Durant, the American historian, traveling in India as late as 1930, pointed out that the entire expenditure of the British on education in India, from the nursery level to the highest universities, was less than half the high school budget of the state of New York. All the Indian Institutes of Technology, the engineering achievements you're talking about, were established after independence by the government of India. Uh, there is simply no comparison between the accomplishments of India rising from the ashes the British left us in and what was done in 200 years. Just, I've just given take, many, just many take, figures. Just, just take one example, the textile industry, because there you are. India was a, a huge exporter of For 2,000 years, it yes, was the yeah. world's leading exporter. What happened? In fact, in the Roman Empire, there are debates recorded by Pliny the Elder hmm. of Roman senators complaining about the amount of the Roman Empire's gold that was being sent off to India because of the tastes of Roman women for Indian muslins, linens, and, and cottons. But was, so it, was, it just, was it just modernism, the industrial revolution yeah. that destroyed that, that, that's, it, or was it something else? No, that's the excuse that apologists like mm -hmm. to make that, you know, oh, it's not our fault, you just missed the bus for the Industrial Revolution. Well, we missed the bus because you threw us under its wheels, is what I tell the <laughs> British. I mean, the fact, is, the fact is, in the name of free trade, the British came in and destroyed the free trade that had made India a leading exporter of textiles. The British soldiers smashed the looms so people couldn't practice their craft. They imposed punitive duties and taxes on the export of Indian textiles while lifting duties on the import of British cloth. And they achieved a captive market at the point of a gun. This is not exactly free trade, as you can imagine. Cities like Murshidabad and Dhaka in the subcontinent were depopulated. In one notorious incident, weavers had their thumbs cut off, so when the looms were repaired, they couldn't weave again. Textiles were systematically destroyed as an industry by the British. And that's only one example of many. Well, I'm going to quickly go back to a question now. Now, Kevin, um, do you accept that perhaps the British weren't quite as benign as you just suggested? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Please read the book, Kevin. There's a lot more there. <laughs> <laughs> I've got the book. I'll bring Laurie in here. He, he gave a speech along these lines to the Oxford Union. He got wild applause um, from the students and others sitting around the Oxford Union Hall. And I'm just wondering, have young Brits come to terms with their colonial past? 
Uh, no, we haven't at all. Young Brits of every class have no idea about our colonial past, and that is, that is being deliberately done. We are deliberately denied or you know, kept away from education about the real, the graphic facts of what the British did around the world, you know, including in this country, to the people of this country. Uh, the crimes of the British and the crimes of the, that we committed and that were done in our names uh, over 400 years of pillage and conquest is something that we don't like to think about, and yet it is everywhere in modern British history. When people talk about Brexit, it, it's stunning to me that if you ask British people who voted for Brexit what their major fear is, their fear is that people will come to our country and take our things. Mm. And That's exactly... Like, you know, <laughs> why... Yeah. I, I, I just can't... It, it doesn't compute, but we don't know this history. You know, I took history in British schools up to the age of 18, and I got a pretty good grade. And most you never of, learned a line of colonial history, did you? Well, almost everything that you have just said, I learned from your book. I'm going to, I'm going to throw it quickly back to Shashi, because um, you know, one of the great heroes of the Second World War, in fact, of the 20th century, uh, Winston Churchill, you've basically accused him in your book of complicity in a famine that killed four million Bengalis. Rightly so. Four point three. I mean, Churchill personally took the decisions that actually not only plunged Bengal into starvation, but had the British actually purchase grain that the Bengalis could barely afford to buy in order to ship it to Europe not to aid the war effort, as his defenders claim, but to boost the buffer stocks in the event of a future possible invasion of Greece and Yugoslavia. People started dying, and Churchill said, well, it's all their fault anyway for breeding like rabbits. He said, I hate the Indians. They're a beastly people with a beastly religion. Oh Australian ships were docking in Calcutta port and were ordered by Churchill and his odious paymaster, General Lord Chobel, not to d disembark their wheat, but to sail on to Europe where their wheat might be used in some future reserve stock. On top of that, when conscience-stricken British officials... Did Churchill know... Did, yes, I was going to say, did Churchill know people would die? Yes, uh, conscience-stricken British officials are constantly sending memoranda to the Prime Minister personally, because it was his decision, saying that people were dying literally on the streets, and all Churchill could bring himself to do was write peevishly on the side of the file, why hasn't Gandhi died yet? Wow. And this is the man the British want us to hail as an apostle of freedom and democracy when he has as much blood on his hands as some of the worst genocidal dictators of the 20th century. Well, thank you.